Welcome Classic Rock fans to another one of my ranking videos and today I'm looking at the studio albums of Pink Floyd which has been much requested and anticipated by you guys. I'd like to say as I always do at this juncture please do click like, subscribe and check that bell so you get notified of any future upload. And if you appreciate the work that goes into these reviews please do check out some of the links below for ways you can support me and my channel. It's always much appreciated. There's even the link to the Facebook page there so you can uh, go across there because I post something on there at least uh, once or twice a day. So number 15 is the Umma Gumma album from 1969. This band go glacial after Barrett's departure and they move away from that through the looking glass affected innocence to a, a, a sort of sonic soundscaping or, or psychedelic noodling as Dave Gilmore affectionately refers to it. I think the live stuff on this album is a wonderful representation of what this band were doing. Beautiful, expansive, spacey instrumentals. But I think it's fair to say that the solo stuff is a little bit patchy. The Narrow Way is a satisfying listen and would feature in the band's live set. And also Grandchester Meadows is a beautiful piece of pastoral folk, which is also another standout moment on this record. Interestingly, Nick Mason said the one thing we learned from Amagama is not to do another album like Amagama. I think it's fair to say at this juncture this band was definitely the sum of its parts. I've heard a lot of you say that the, that the album's title should be pronounced Umaguma, but seeing as the first two letters are U and M, which is phonetically um, I'm going to stick with that pronunciation, right or wrong. Richard Wright's Sisyphus is a, an intriguing number on this one. It's a mishmash of classical piano, uh, orchestrated chaos, and with some eerie vocals for, for added far outedness. It starts off with that funereal like dirge of the organ and the cymbal clash. Reminds me a little bit of that uh, Yardbird song, Still I'm Sad. Nevertheless, I have to say that listening to this is pretty arduous. Ironically, it's like pushing a bloody great boulder up a hill. In terms of the solo stuff, I have to say that The Narrow Way is the, the best piece on this record, but even that is uh, uh, an experiment in, in various guitar stylings. The vocals, of course, also very low in the mix. I don't know whether that's to create a sense of distance, or whether it's just bad production. It takes your pick, really. I think Nick Mason's uh, section is the weakest solo stuff on this record, which just comes across as, a, as an extended piece of percussive clatter, suggesting that his uh, you know, abilities lie in performance rather than uh, composition. And that wonderful sleeve, uh, of course, by Hypnosis, was taken at uh, a friend of Storm Thorgerson's house at Great Shelford in Cambridgeshire. Uh, the overall effect creates the illusion, that 3D effect. Storm Thorgerson said that the idea behind it was uh, to illustrate the simple idea that Floyd music was multi-layered. Number 14 is More, also from 1969. I read somewhere that Pink Floyd don't actually regard this as a Pink Floyd album, and that they regard this period from 68 to 1970 as a kind of a creative downtime. And as I said, that period after Sid's departure was defined by those uh, spacey, drawn out instrumentals and avant-garde sonic soundscaping, punctuated, of course, with the occasional attempt at a pop single, like uh, Point Me at the Sky, for example. Uh, Point Me at the Sky was dismissed by Rolling Stone as just a charming piece of psychedelic chamber music. In my opinion, film soundtracks uh, can be a patchy affair as their raison d'etre is to effectively serve a larger project. They're kind of like a, a musical equivalent to a, to a subordinate clause, the main clause being the film itself. And the music on, on this, like the film, really accompanies Estelle and Stefan's journey from Paris to Ibiza and their gradual descent. Sirius Minor is a gorgeous, spacey, ambient piece with that uh, organ outro, very reminiscent of uh, Source Full of Secrets. Interestingly, Sirius is Latin for a curl of hair, but also refers to uh, a cloud formation, I believe, which is probably where they're going with on this one. One of the songs on this album, The Crying Song, is one of my favourites. It would certainly would not be out of place on Atom Heart Mother or even Medal. I think it reflects Gilmore's love of an interest in Crosby, Stills and Nash at this juncture, as pointed out in the wonderful book by John Harris. And Green is the Colours are another beautiful pastoral and serene number with some nice flute flourish and psychedelic affectations. But, but for me, the standout track on this album is Cymbeline. It's dark, it's ominous and a wonderful platform for Gilmore's voice. And it would feature in the band's live set at this juncture in extended form and it was, I have to say, devastatingly beautiful. Number 13 is The Endless River from 2014. This feels like a heartfelt eulogy for Richard Wright, and it comprises of 18 tracks organised into four movements, each conjuring up a specific mood. This was described by Rolling Stone as a, a requiem through familiar echoes. Despite the sound's low ranking on my list, I do rather enjoy it, and I listen to it every summer. It stands as a beautiful requiem to the talents of Richard Wright. 
and his playing is uh, very prominent on this, which is no doubt as it should be. Nick Mason said they considered making the Division Bell a double album with the second record being a collection of ambient pieces, which is effectively what we get here. Of course, it would be uh, it was amusingly dubbed the Big Spliff. I often wondered if Richard Wright was somewhat disappointed with the direction that the Division Bell uh, took becoming a more song-focused single album. In fact, he went on to uh, create a great thematic piece himself in his solo effort, Broken China. You know, despite the howls of derision against this album, I, I find it an immersive listen. I love the sound of Nick Mason's languid drumming and uh, Richard Wright's keyboard parts on this. And it's, it's those elements that were very much missing from the original mix of a momentary lapse of reason. Ingredients that are, are core to the Pink Floyd sound as far as I'm concerned. I really enjoy uh, Richard Wright's organ bits played at the Albert Hall in 1969 on this album. It's a glorious uh, tribute to his legacy with this band. And not in any way to underplay Gilmore's contribution to this album. His guitar phrasings are, as always, spacey, ethereal and absolutely sublime. I just enjoy listening to this music simply evolving, simply being. So for better or worse, I do rather enjoy this album, despite it coming across as a bit of a patchwork quilt, a jumble of half-conceived, collected uh, conceptual phrases and motifs. Number 12 is the final cut from 1983. This is a Pink Floyd album in name only. It's very much a Roger Waters solo work. It's uh, full of bile and spleen. As you can imagine, the atmosphere between Waters and Gilmore at this juncture must have been tense, to say the least. Gilmore went on to ruefully dub this album the final straw, even removing his name from the production credits. Interestingly, critic Chris Linden Barber described this album as nothing but a series of outtakes from an Alan Price LP, a milestone in the history of awfulness. But not all the critics were disparaging about it. Rolling Stone described it as a masterpiece of art rock. I mean, my opinion of this album tends to sit between the two stools, really. The poet Matthew Arnold said the truth sits upon the lips of dying men. And this album is very much about giving voice to those men that were sacrificed during the Second World War, who were sold the idea of the post-war dream. In fact, this album is uh, organized structurally around two concepts. Really, The first part is the sacrifice made by those men during the Second World War, and the idea of the post-war dream ultimately betrayed. And the second part, of course, is uh, a particular political class that sends young men to fight and die for lost causes or for causes that are just not worthy. Now, Roger Waters famously said that I'm not a pacifist. I do believe that war is necessary in some cases. However, I just don't think the Falklands conflict was one of those cases. Of course, Gilmore and Mason are relegated on the sound to supporting musicians. In fact, Gilmore uh, sardonically said, you know, if you need a guitarist, just give me a call. And Gilmore has suggested, of course, that this album is the, the culmination after Animals and the Wall of Pink Floyd moving away from uh, melody, music and song structure to a more... Uh, overt concern with concept and lyrics and it has to be said in this case highly politicized ones this album did do rather well it reached number one and stayed there for 25 weeks and for me the standout tracks are the beautiful Southampton Dock and uh, Two Sons in the Sunset number 11 is Obscured by Clouds from 1972 this was recorded at the Chateau d'Ereville in France, of course, where Jethro Tull famously recorded their Chateau Disaster tapes, those uh, wonderful recordings that would lead on to the Passion Play album. Also, Elton John and Cat Stevens have also recorded there. Interesting, in 1971, The Grateful Dead played that wonderful concert in 1971 on the grounds of the Chateau. I believe it was filmed, if I'm not mistaken. Again, this album is a film soundtrack, and I stand by what I said uh, previously about film soundtracks. However, there are some exquisite moments of Floydness on this. I love the first two tracks on this album, such a powerful opening when that drone explodes into When You're In. Of course, it's the soundtrack to the film uh, The Valet, or La Valley, I think it's said in French, excuse me if my uh, pronunciation is off. But it's a film that maps out a journey to a kind of hippie utopia. It's still firmly rooted in that 1960s aesthetic, that idea of a sexual liberation and drug experimentation. And the 10 tracks on this album beautifully recreate the atmosphere of the film. Uh, there's some exquisite Floyd moments on here from songs like What's the Other Deal, Free Four, or perhaps my favourite on this album is Gilmore's number, Childhood's End, named after an Arthur C. Clarke novel of the same name. Nick Mason has said that this was not a Pink Floyd record, just a collection of songs that we all liked. Of course, this album begins with that wonderful drone in A minor and its use of syncopated synth pads before Gilmore's soaring guitar just takes it to a new level. And that explodes into When You're In, a wonderful doff the cap in tribute to Chris Adamson, the band's road manager, who would use the term When You're In when he was balancing the sound. 
a wonderful album with some great tunes, uh, pretty inconsistent in places, which is usual for film soundtracks. But I tend to agree with Nick Mason on this. It doesn't feel like a cohesive Pink Floyd number, but rather a sporadic assortment of tunes. Number 10 is a momentary lapse of reason from 2019. Now I say 2019 because I'm specifically referring to the remixed version of this album rather than its original 1987 release. Now the original album would be much lower on my list as it's a sterile affair and bears a little resemblance to, to Pink Floyd. It's effectively a Gilmore solo album really. Of course the 2019 mix changes all that. The wonderful languid drumming style of Nick Mason is fully restored as is the keyboard parts of Richard Wright, often uh, purloined from live performances. It really does elevate this album. It feels like a Pink Floyd album, a resurrected Pink Floyd album. and has that timeless quality that classic Floyd always had. Yet Another Movie is my favourite track on this album. This album has a warmth and an organic feel to it. It's not so plastic, not so fake. It's stripped of all those horrible 1980s production affectations like uh, uh, electronic drums and reverb-drenched vocals and guitar. All these things that so dated the original mix. If you are interested in uh, hearing more about this album, do check out the review I've done on this on my channel. Number nine is A Saucer Full of Secrets from 1968. A psych classic undoubtedly, but a bit of a mishmash, uh, emblematic of a band in transition, shall we say. Largely Sidless affair, but nevertheless he looms over this one like some acid-drenched Cheshire cat. As I've said at the band at this juncture, we see them moving away from that Barrett uh, childlike whimsy to embrace more political socio-economic concerns. Of course we get the spacey avant-gardism of the title track, and that sardonic rage which is Corporal Clegg, replete with a kazoo solo of course. The sound feels like a symphonic progressive exploration, one that of course would uh, reach its fruition of echoes in 1971 via Atom Heartmother. The sleeve, which is a wonderful psychedelic montage, is the first to be designed by hypnosis and gives the impression of a psychedelic journey. In fact, Storm Thorgerson said of it that it was supposed to represent the three altered states of consciousness that was religion, drugs and the music of Pink Floyd. Interestingly, Barry Miles in his fascinating book on Pink Floyd describes this album as deeply architectural. In fact, he goes on to say, the change from the Sid Barrett period into the music of three architecture students was really quite dramatic. Their architectural vision of music flowered into great cathedral constructions of sound. And of course, those short, whimsical pieces that very much define the debut album are replaced with, with those rambling psychedelic montages, more spacey than space rock. Of course, space rock is a term that uh, uh, the band have all passionately refuted. And the title track was known as the Mass Gadgets of Oxemenes and the Mass Gadgets of Hercules before eventually uh, assuming the title of A Source Full of Secrets. However, it wasn't until the US pressing of Amagama that the track was actually broken down into its individual sections, uh, those being Something Else, Syncopated Pandemonium, Storm Signal and Celestial Voices. I love that syncopated pandemonium section which is based on drums and dissonant piano chords, um, not to mention an awful lot of clatter. And Celestial Voices of course is dominated by the organ and Mellotron, making it a winner as far as I'm concerned. If you're interested in one of the best live versions uh, of this track, check out The Bootleg, uh, the band who ate asteroids for breakfast. Number 8 is The Wall from 1979. This was the album that was described as bleak, manic and agonised by The Guardian, yet conversely adolescently puerile by John Lusk writing for the BBC. Nevertheless, it's a sprawling narrative that deals poetically with uh, alienation, grief, death, madness, the existentialist's greatest hits. I admit to absolutely adoring sides one and two of this album, uh, Happiest Days of Our Lives, uh, Another Brick in the Wall, part one and two, Mother, and Goodbye Blue Sky is profoundly moving, just the way it unfolds. That's before it embraces more ominous atmospheres with its minor chords and stabbing vocals. I do appreciate that my ranking of this album here will upset a few people, but I do feel that it's conceptually sprawling. I tend to agree with the music critic Robin Denislow when he describes it as a a long, uneven work that seems to lose direction on the confusing third and fourth sides. I must admit it has an interesting structure as it's cyclical uh, and you know, it sort of plays with notions of you know, perceived reality and, and time, you know, like some of the best works of modernist fiction in fact. The wall opens of course with that, uh, that voice squeaking, we came in, obviously connecting it to the closing of the album isn't this where. 
and they have made strong use of uh, recurring motifs and, and repeated numbers, re reconfigured numbers, and interesting use of cross-fading as well. It all adds to a, a sense of a con uh, continuation, a continuation and perpetuation of anguish and loss, no doubt. This album is a fascinating musical sonic soundscape as well. It's a word I use quite a lot, but it really is on this album. We embrace so many different genres from the operatic to rock to even uh, some doo-wop textures as well on side four. I have to admit that my interest in this album begins to wane by side three and I've generally tuned out by side four. Nevertheless, it was a hugely influential record uh, for me. I, you know, I remember getting it in 79 and playing the grooves of it. I did a video called Records That Changed My Life. Uh, you know, you can hear my wall story there. I must admit though, it's not an album I play very often. I do tend to prefer the more band-centered albums that preceded it. Uh, you know, I love Gerald Scarf's illustrations on this. They're spiky and really add to the atmosphere and anguish of this album. And I truly believe that the extended metaphor of the wall is the ultimate symbol of isolation and alienation is, is absolutely inspired. There are undoubtedly moments of intense beauty on this record, but I, I do feel it's a, a little bit bloated. There you are, I've said it. I can imagine all the hate and bile and the how dare he's spewing out in the comments below. As much as I love Pink Floyd, I, I just refuse to salivate over the wall, which is a pretty disgusting image in itself. Number seven is The Division Bell from 1994. This album essentially has communication, relations between people as its central theme, possibly a bit of a dig at Waters, as uh, let's not forget The Wall was all about paranoid isolation and alienation. And for a record essentially about communication, it certainly prompted some acerbic communications from Roger Waters, describing his bandmates as incompetent and this album as a forgery. I think he described it as a bloody awful album. Rolling Stone also weren't particularly flattering either, saying that it's, uh, it's an album that warns of the dangers of unchecked nostalgia. Despite its detractors, I, I really rather like this album. I think Cluster One, the opening track, I, I believe, is an exploration of mood and tones and really starts the proceedings well. Uh, Maroon is an ethereal, beautiful piece of music. And I really enjoy the blues-infused number, What Do You Want From Me? And Poles Apart, I think, journeys into vintage Floyd territory with its use of sound effects and some very sinister-sounding circus music at one point. And of course, High Hopes with its... Uh, uh, employment of these little motifs that harken back to the Floyd Mac catalogue. It's just uh, it's got a sublime chorus and an absolutely beautiful soaring solo from Gilmore at the end. It's just a beautiful evocation of days gone by. Number six is Piper at the Gates of Dawn from 1967. Such music I never dreamed of, says Rat to Mole in Wind in the Willows. He could so much be speaking of the album which derives its title from that said same book. An album described as music from a freaked out fairyland by Jenny Fabian. This collection of songs draws heavily from the paradigms of English folklore and whimsy, no doubt influenced by the, the books that Sid imbibed when he was a child. In fact, Matilda Mother actually used uh, lyrics from the Hilaire Belloc uh, book, Cautionary Tales for Children, until the writer's estate objected, of course, and then the song becomes a little bit more tea with Tolkien. And these songs are filled, of course, with that through the looking glass sense of wonder, and affected innocence, uh, as well as the terrifying world of nursery rhymes, where stars will frighten indeed. I think it's true that the songs on this album lack that punky psychedelia of uh, the singles Arnold Lang and C. Emily play, instead preferring to employ a more dreamlike, childlike atmosphere. Phil Spector famously said that a genius is the ability to see things beyond the perception of everybody else. And we are certainly encouraged to view the world through the medium of Sid's imagination, one populated by fairies, goblins and impish sprites. Sid articulates these fantasies perfectly, often employing some rather strange inarticulations, from interstellar howls to uh, numerous clicks and squawks, sounding like a serious dose of lysergic Tourette's. Nevertheless, it's all good stuff. Number five is Medal from 1971. That resounding high ping on the piano warped, of course, as it's fed through that rotating Leslie speaker was a phenomenal moment for this band. Seen as a precursor to their conceptual masterpiece of 1973 with its exploration of themes, philosophical exploration of themes like alienation and empathy, with the lyrics for Echoes unashamedly filched from uh, Across the Universe and I Am the Walrus. A lot of the aquatic references in, in that track are, are referenced in the, the blues and greens of the album artwork, or, or vice versa perhaps. It's a 23 minute prog psych voyage from tranquility, desolation, and finally resolution at the end of it. 
This album sees this band taking a huge stride into the 70s, and David Gilmour really announces himself on this record. I think Rolling Stone said so itself. David Gilmour's emergence as a real shaping force with the group is apparent here. They started recording this in uh, early 71 at Abbey Road Studios. Uh, the first album they'd worked on together as a band in the studio since Sourceful of Secrets, according to Nick Mason. And that opening instrumental, mostly instrumental, that visceral tour de force uh, that is one of these days, which with a beautiful vocal performance from Nick Mason, of course. It's a barbaric hard rock yacht that contrasts with the narcotized, languid, pillowy shades of the rest of the side. I love the line in the, the song Pillow of Winds, a cloud of eider down draws around me softening the sound. It establishes a tone of languid ennui and echoes, no pun intended, the song Flaming from uh, Piper of the Gates of Dawn of its lyric. Alone in the clouds all blue, lying on an eider down. And of course the side ends with that uh, bluesy hound infused number Seamus. This album is significant as well, it's the last time we'd see a band portrait until about 1987 on any of their albums, allowing, in the words of George Reich, the spotlight to illuminate the metaphysical and phenomenological furniture of modern life like death, alienation and anxiety. And I guess you could say the story continues. Number four is Wish You Were Here from 1975. This is a beautiful meditation on absence and loss with Sid rattling his chains from the margins like Banquo's ghost, before emerging, of course, as the brilliant and dazzling metaphor of the Crazy Diamond. I think this album is beautifully sequenced. I'm so glad that they, uh, they produced an album that had a conceptual thread to it rather than just a collection of uh, songs, which I think was Gilmore's suggestion. It presents a beautiful, elgiac narrative of non-being and absence, uh, set amid the harsh backdrop of fame and, of course, the music industry. Shining New Crazy Diamond is a sublime gesture of recognition, uh, both luminous and desolate at the same time. It just unfolds majestically with that beautiful, uh, gorgeous organ parts and those wistful guitar phrasings from David Gilmore before we get that four note appreggio uh, chiming out as probably one of the most recognisable motifs in rock. Overall, this album has a placid atmosphere of quiet regret. And when Waters starts singing, his pained mewing is beautifully effective here. Um, a valediction evoking the loss of a childhood friend. Remember when you were young, you shone like the sun. And then, of course, it segues into the dramatic welcome to the machine before we get these spiky vocals of Roy Harper. And Wish You Were Here it is so stark and honest, uh, constructed around a series of questions. I mean, this is Waters writing at its very best. I don't remember who said it, but... Uh, there's a quote that says, in order to be honest with yourself, you have to first reconcile the glory and the scum that lies within every human heart. I think this is at the very heart of the way Waters writes as well, and especially the way he writes about the human condition. Undoubtedly, this is a remarkable album from a band that, by their own admission, said they felt a little bit lost psychologically after the stratospheric success of Dark Side of the Moon. And, you know, they've certainly tapped into that sense of longing to produce these sublime tones and exquisite music, as well as a, a, a befitting tribute to a fallen band member. Number three is Animals from 1977, Waters' dystopian beast fable. Using Orwell's Animal Farm as an inspiration, Waters manages to shape his own vitriolic response to the inequalities of capitalism. It is an angry album, opines David Gilmour. I mean, no shit. Forget the phlegm and nihilism of punk, this album it bristles with rage and indignation. I also used to see this as a, a kind of a lost album, a kind of forgotten album in, in many respects in, in the 70s. It was eclipsed by Dark Side of the Moon and perhaps overshadowed by The Wall. But this is a, a truly a masterpiece. Not only is it conceptually intriguing, but it's musically beautiful as well. Uh, it has some sublime melodic sections to it. And this is Dave Gilmore's guitar playing its very, very best as far as I'm concerned. Nevertheless, in Waters' own words, this album signalled the end of Pink Floyd as it had been before. As I said, this record is a lacerating attack on the inequalities of capitalism and the financial gluttony, but also on the righteous posturing of people like Mary Whitehouse. It contains as much rage and righteous indignation as any punk album at this juncture, and does so more effectively, I think, with its clever allegorical representation of certain types. It's a bleak, dystopian critique of uh, class and modern society and it's incredibly powerful I have to say. And the In The Flesh tour that followed this wasn't uh, wasn't without drama either. Uh, I'm, of course I'm referring to the famous gobbing incident in Montreal. 
I must admit it was the animal section of Waters Last Tour which got the biggest response from the the audience there with his rage and ire uh, redirected at a certain ex-US uh, president. I'll never forget seeing Trump as a pig uh, blazing, blazing across uh, Bassley power stations in his rendition of pigs, three different ones. Just as potent and splenetic today as it was then. Number two is the Atom Heart Mother from 1970. Now, of course, I understand that conceptually and thematically and in many ways that Wish You Were Here in Animals is a superior album to this. But in terms of sheer pleasure and enjoyment derived from listening to Pink Floyd, this album will always feature very high on my list. Nevertheless, it was an album uh, dismissed as rubbish by David Gilmour and Roger Waters certainly hasn't uh, spoken often in glowing terms either. However, Classic Rock Magazine has uh, said that this album is groundbreaking due to a number of reasons. I mean, if I may quote from the aforementioned publication, uh, number one, it was the first British rock album to feature one track covering an entire side of vinyl. Number two, it was the first album to uh, have absolutely no indication on the sleeve of who the artist was or the title or any information whatsoever. It was the first Pink Floyd album to uh, bring in an outside writer, namely Ron Giesen, of course. Four, it was the first Pink Floyd album to be uh, mixed into quadraphonic sound. Five, it was the first Pink Floyd album to go to number one in the UK chart. On this album, we see the band moving away from that pop psychedelia. Uh, they struggled with that after, after Barrett anyway. But what we get here is that they attempt something extraordinary, where the seeds of those uh, conceptual behemoths of the 1970s can be detected. The title track, of course, originally called The Amazing Pudding, is an exquisite exploration of Floydness with lots of dark and ominous tones to it. Um, a melodic, flawed, meandering orchestral opus named after Constance Laddle and her nuclear-powered ticker. This album marks the point, uh, if I may quote Classic Rock magazine again, where Pink Floyd come in from the cold of their post-Barrett malaise. Themes of madness are explored, of course, a popular leitmotif for Waters in the, the plaintive musing of the song If, made up of a series of conditionals. And let's not forget the one of my favourite Floyd numbers of all time is the bucolic tones of Fat Old Son. It's a hymnal ode to the English countryside with its evocation of summer evening birds and new mown grass. It is Arcadian in its tranquil, almost narcotized depiction of a, a summer's day, probably in the wilds of Cambridgeshire. And I love Wright's dedication to a groupie in summer of 68, no doubt uh, resulting in a serious dose of the clap. And of course, Alan's psychedelic breakfast punctuated by Rody Alan Styles frying up his bacon and eggs. This album for me is one of those uh, oral comfort blankets that I dig out every summer, along with the Beach Boys Pet Sounds and uh, Zombies Odyssey and Oracle. I used to collect specifically Pink Floyd bootlegs from 70 to about 72, just, just so I could hear different renditions of the title track and Fat Old Son performed live. I confess to being rather obsessed with this one. And number one is Dark Side of the Moon from 1973. The moon is viewed as a potent and powerful symbol across many cultures and civilizations, seen as a motif emblematic of um, yearning and the human heart. Of course, George Bailey tries to lasso it for his girlfriend, Mary, and Paul Simon sings uh, about it on his Hearts and Bones album, famously saying, if you want to write a song about the heart, think about the moon before you start. And this album has no doubt changed the trajectory of this band, very much like the dispersed light refracting off through that uh, famous iconic prism sleeve. And it's an album that uh, continues to chime long after that final heartbeat has ceased to resonate. And one that speaks to subsequent generations with its uh, uncompromising portrayal of the permanent truth of things. Our shared humanity is critiqued, not just our corporeal reality as, uh, as on music from the body, but the lived experience and that interconnectedness, the choices we make where everything has potential. Everything under the sun is in tune, but unfortunately the sun is eclipsed by the moon. This album entered the charts sandwiched between Slade Slade and Alice Cooper's Billion Dollar Babies. It's a remarkable, timeless piece that I, I never get tired of listening to. And I think it's fair to say it's a wonderful culmination of this band all pushing in the same direction. And talking of directions, of course, the cultural meanderings of this album are odd to say the least, from Wizard of Oz mashups to various samples and parodies to the album cover gazing out at us from a millions of t-shirts, coffee mugs, baby grows and coasters. It's a living, breathing piece of conceptual art that continues to resonate with audiences around the world. It is my favourite Pink Floyd album. In fact, I'd go as far to say it's my favourite album. 
I know I'd like to thank you for tuning into this. Do check out my other videos and share this video. Click like, subscribe and check that bell. And do check out some of the links below this video for ways you can support me in this channel. And anyway, I hope you're staying warm and safe. And most importantly, please do keep listening.